maybe it would be appropriate to have a prayer and have a song. Have a song and have a prayer. Maybe make the song the final thing and be like our Lord and his disciples from 2,000 years ago. And that would be a wonderful thing indeed. The more we can model our Savior, the better off we are. There is our theme for the hour, brethren. And so our Bibles are open now to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, I'll give you the verse momentarily. And let me begin like this with your careful attention with open minds and open Bibles to the Word of God. Who we think we are as the church and what we think we are as the church may not correspond to who we ought to be as the church and what we ought to be as the church. Did you get that? I want to say it one more time. Who we think we are as the church and what we think we are as the church may not correspond to who we ought to be as a church and what we ought to be as the church. And I'm talking about us, the church of Christ, the church that belongs to Christ. And what I have said and the way I've said it has been intentional on my part, and I hope you'll ponder that. I hope you'll turn that over in your mind tonight. Think about it as we go through our sermon and that will lead us into the title of our sermon and into the body of our sermon tonight. What kind of church are we? We have to do that from time to time. I'm, I'm offering that as my judgment, and I'll qualify that as my judgment. When I offer a judgment over the 40 years that I've been preaching, Dan, I try to qualify it as my judgment. Uh, preachers are going to offer their judgment from time to time. Hopefully our judgment is, even, even that judgment is grounded in the Word of God. But I, I make sure, or try to make sure, that I qualify it as my judgment. And then you'll know you, you can disagree, and we can disagree on things and not be disagreeable. We can disagree on things and not be ugly or unkind to one another. Uh, I believe that with all of my heart. And I'm not saying that I've been perfect with that. Uh, in my life, but I'll tell you what, I do a lot better at 62 with that, Ronnie, than I did at 22. At 22, I was, well, there, there's a place for being bold, and there, but, but uh, boldness can sometimes lead you into a trap. And so I, I'm a better man at 62 than I was 40 years ago. You think about your life. You think about the church here at Adamsville. And, and I have been thinking for... 23 plus years by the church exchange mountain where Shane and I work and worship and where I serve as the preacher and we're just 25, 30 minutes down the road. Uh, I told Shane on the drive up here multiple times that it's almost a shame that we don't have more contact with one another as two congregations of the Lord's church and we're within a half hour of one another. But we, we've got our work there and you've got your work here and abroad and Ronnie and I travel quite a bit. Uh, I'm, I'm back to a full slate of gospel meetings this year. I'll have, I think, nine this year. And so we're busy. You are. I am. We are. But let us never forget to ask the question that is before you. What kind of church are we? Who are we? What are we? And who ought we to be? And what ought we to be? And so I want to answer that tonight. And I want to do so in a heartfelt way, I hope in an encouraging way, and always a biblical way. You've got your Bible handy, whether it's a, a physical copy or an electronic copy, have it handy. Be ready to, to go to the passages and, uh, and turn there. Now, uh, Brother Burnett, is that right? Yeah, right there. Danny, Danny, and, and I met Danny tonight. Danny, a nephew of one of our late members, our treasurer, our song leader, and a super dear friend of mine, the late brother Jerry Burnett, was our treasurer for so many years, and our main song leader, and organized our song leaders. I conducted his funeral not, not, not that, a few years ago, I guess maybe close to four, Danny, now, but uh, Jerry was a wonderful Christian gentleman, 19 years older than me. But he said, and I said, and we would say, we're just, we're like brothers. I mean, physical brothers. We, we had so much in common with our background and all. He just happened to be 19 years older than me. But Jerry, Danny, your uncle, your late uncle, and faithful brother that he was, he said, Mel, 
We couldn't afford you if we had to pay you by the word. And I was commenting what Ronnie said a moment ago. I, wanted to, I meant to throw that out early and I forgot to. But I, I've always remembered that. We couldn't afford you, Brother Mel, if we had to pay you by the word. And I'd say, I guess, I guess that's right. But you could try. <laughs> so, so there you go. There you go. I talk a little fast and we get wound up. But brethren, here we go now with the word of God tonight. What kind of church are we? Point number one, brethren, we are a gospel church. We are a gospel church. We better be a gospel church. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 15. Now, we're going to look at more than that verse, as you well know, but that will be our primary proof text for point number one tonight. For though you have, are you there, 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers, here we are now, watch it, for in Christ Jesus have I begotten you by or through the gospel. Brethren, friends, we're a gospel church because we have been begotten by the gospel. And we've been begotten by the gospel because the Apostle Paul declared 2,000 years ago that God's power to save is where? In the gospel. Romans 1, 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation unto everyone that believeth, unto the Jew first and also to the Greek. We are. We believe we are. We know we are a gospel church begotten by the gospel. The gospel is God's power to save. And it is not just the gospel. Well, Ryan, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look at the beginning of what we call the gospel of Mark, the book of Mark. Mark 1 and verse 1. Are you there? Mark 1 and verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mark chapter 1, verse 1. You'd be hard-pressed to find a better beginning than that, brethren. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Indeed, isn't that rich and isn't that beautiful? Because we've been begotten by the gospel, and because the gospel is God's power to save, and because it's the gospel of Jesus Christ, then we believe that like our Lord and like Paul, we ought to, Sean, we ought to preach the gospel. And so go with me. The example of our Lord about that is found in Matthew 9 and verse 15. Other places as well, but I, I like Matthew 9, 15. Here we are now, Matthew chapter 9, verse 15. And he, all those pronouns, I've been <laughs> emphasizing pronouns uh, throughout our, our meeting here. Pronouns are so very, very important in English uh, and uh, in Greek. In every language, pronouns are very, very important. Watch it now. Are you there? Matthew 9, 15. And he went about all the cities and villages. And those are two different Greek words. In the first century, a city was not a village and a village was not a city. Two entirely different Greek words. There, there's not a redundancy there, but two different Greek words translated by two different English words. And he, Jesus, went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogue, here we are now, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. We can do no less. We can do no less. And finally, relative to this particular point, I am going to consider one more thing in just a moment and give you a, a, a quote from a poet. But watch it now. Paul's testimony about preaching the gospel, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 16. Here's what you'll find. Paul wrote, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. And I, I really hope, Ronnie, that our preacher friends really believe that. Yea, yes, in fact, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. And when you read a woe in the Bible, that ought to give you ought to give us pause. When you read that woe, that ought to give us pause. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Now, as we wrap up point number one, I want to do it like this. And I invite your careful attention before we go to our second point tonight. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 2. Here's what Paul wrote. Ye, we would say today, you, you are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. 
Ye are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 2. Decades ago, I ran across a poem that I am convinced was based upon that verse. And won't you listen to that poem? The poet said, and I quote, You are writing a gospel, a chapter each day, by deeds that you do, by words that you say. Men, read what you write, whether faulty or true. Say, what is the gospel according to you? Brethren and friends, we better be a gospel church. And we better realize that we are, as Paul said, you are our epistle written in our hearts, and we're being known and read of all men. And we need to live the gospel. People will read our lives, and in doing so, in a way, read the gospel lived by you or not lived by you, and they'll draw conclusions from that, whether good or bad, positive or negative, ugly or beautiful, and we control that. Let us determine to be a gospel church. When things arise in our lives, and they do. When things arise in our families, and they do. Uh, and when things arise in the local church, and they do. Let's remember that at the end of every day, in the beginning of every new day, it is the gospel that ought to govern our thinking and our doing, and we're going to yield ourselves to the gospel this day and every day. And if we fail to do that, and we probably will, we have, then let's be man enough, woman enough, Christian enough, let us be bold enough to make it right. We may have to swallow some pride. I have had to in the past. Suck that pride down, baby, and get right back there and be who you need to be. Be who you need to be. Please remember that. We want to be the people who God would have us to be. If we're going to be the church that God would have us to be, we absolutely must be a gospel church. Point number two, brethren and friends, because we're a gospel church, we are a going church, and all of our points have a word that itself begins with the letter G. I've done that on purpose to aid all of us in ease of memorization, remembering the points of the sermon tonight. And I hope you'll take it with you, not because I'm doing the preaching, whether it was me or Brother Ronnie, but because what we preach is drawn through and from the very Word of God. Because we are a gospel church, we are a going church. Now, we were at Matthew chapter 10 on Monday night when I preached on the title of Why Are So Many Lost? Why Are So Many Lost? Now we're going back there to the very same verses or part of them. In fact, we're going to begin back in verse 5. I've got just verse 7 on the screen. We're going to begin back at verse 5, but we're going to highlight something different from what we did on Monday night. What? Go not into the way of the Gentiles. Are you there? Matthew 10, 5 and following. Go not into the way of Gentiles. And into any city of the Samaritans, enter you not. Look at that word, go. But go rather unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Go, 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 go. Don't go here, go there. And as you go, you do this. Because we are a gospel church, Tommy, we are a going church. And we can't forget the going. We can't forget the going. Individually, as families, and as the body of believers right here at Addisville, at Shades Mountain, for Shana and I, we can't forget the going. We, we must never cease to go in one way or another. Sometimes that going is through a representative. We, in fact, we do that all the time. We can't all go everywhere. It's impossible. But we can't help with the support of others, Brother Renee, as they go, and we, we make it possible for them to go. Now, I, I say to my brethren at Shades Mountain, I, I hope I say it regularly. Maybe I don't. Maybe I need to say it more. But I, from time to time, and I need to do it more, but from time to time, I thank my brethren at Shades Mountain who make it possible for me to, to preach. They support me financially so I can preach the gospel and, and so I can do like I'm doing here and, and do some travel. Uh, a month ago, I was at the Shelbyville Road Congregation in Indianapolis, Indiana. 
Uh, earlier this year, I was at the West Concord uh, congregation right here in Jefferson County. And uh, uh, earlier in the year, I was, uh, I was in Sardis, Tennessee, about a half hour uh, east of, of Henderson and Freed Hardeman University. And, and I've got, uh, I think, another four or so gospel meetings to go this year and summer series and vacation Bible schools. And my brethren at Shades Mountain make that possible for me to do that. And you make that possible by the invitation to come here and, and, uh, and through your remuneration uh, for me and to me for uh, my labors in preaching the gospel. And you do that for Ronnie. And Ronnie and I appreciate that. We love you for that. And uh, if I don't say it enough, I, then I'll say, say it more. Thank you. Uh, you brethren here. And thank you, my Shades Mountain brethren. And I'll tell them that Sunday morning when I get back. Thank you for making it possible for me to preach the gospel, to be part of a gospel church and a going church. And that's why we have the Great Commission. That's why we have Mark's account of the Great Commission. That's why we have go ye to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned or condemned. Mark 16, 15, and 16. That's why we have the record that we do in Acts chapter 8 Verses 1 and uh, verse 1 and following. Are you there? Acts 8, 1 and following. Oh, maybe, uh, maybe uh, a sentence down in verse 1. And at that time, there was a great persecution. Acts 8, 1 and following. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Drop down to verse 3. What was Saul doing? Later to be known as Paul. Here you go now. As for Saul, Acts 8, 3, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house. The King James says, hailing. The Greek word means dragging out. Think about that. Dragging out men and women, committed them to prison. Here we are now. All of that to provide context. All of that to provide context for verses 4 and 5. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad, Acts 8, 4 and following. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word they're going and then Philip went down to the city of Samaria verse 5 and preached Christ unto them they're going and we can do no less later in the chapter Acts 8 and verse 29 and the spirit of the Lord told Philip to go near and join the, what there's our word go go near and join thyself to this chariot and he ran thither to him I'm in verse 30 now of Acts chapter 8 he ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said understandest thou what thou readest and he said how can I except some man should guide me and he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him and the place of the scripture where he read was this as a sheep led to the slaughter and he's quoting Isaiah 53 7 and following Again and again and again. I know I'm moving hurriedly. We've got a number of points tonight. But go, go, go. And we can go. And we ought to be a going church. Because we are a gospel church. Point number three. What kind of church are we? We're a growing church. A growing church. Because we are a gospel church. We are a going church, Brother Lewis. And because we're a going church. We're a growing church. Maybe the growth doesn't come as quickly as we would like. Maybe we're looking for numerical growth, but we're not thinking about the spiritual growth that needs to precede that. So we need to slow down, rein ourselves in, back up, maybe even stop, and rethink things. I want to give you three verses here. One's on the screen before you. Three proof texts for point number three. We'll move to a fourth point, and then again continue and conclude our message of the hour. What kind of church are we? Point number three, we are a growing church. Acts chapter six and verse seven. And the word of God increased. That didn't mean their Bible got thicker. It just meant, <laughs> meant the word was proclaimed more. Their Bible wasn't getting thicker. The, the word was proclaimed and the word of God increased. And the number of the disciples was multiplied in Jerusalem greatly and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Acts nine and verse 31. Acts chapter 9 and verse 31. Then had the church's peace. We've looked at this verse already. Then had the church's peace throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria. And were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit were multiplied. All of that, all of that because of the increase of the word. Because of the proclamation of the word. A gospel church leads to a going church, leads to a growing church. 
Acts chapter 16 and verse 5. And here's what you'll find. And so the churches were established. Your Bible may read strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. Note that the spiritual growth occurred prior to the numerical growth, Brad. Got to have that. Got to have that. We're not going to bring the gospel in the back door. We're not ashamed of the gospel. We're taking the gospel through the front door. We're not running it up the, the back steps because we, we don't want to turn people away. I've heard that, Ronnie, through the years. Well, if they really know what we believe up front, they're not going to attend with us. Uh, well, what are you ashamed of? The gospel. Let's have the gospel up front. Now, they'll either receive it or they'll reject it. Uh, God is not going to override people's free will, and I'm so grateful for that. But he will judge us. He will judge us that last great day. And so we are a gospel church. We are a going church. And then we believe we are a growing church spiritually. Edification is there. And then numerical growth. And it'll be up and down. It'll be up and down. You'll see a, a peak and then you'll see a valley. And you'll see a, a leveling off and then a peak or maybe two valleys in a row. You, you can't formulate this in any human way. But I know this, and you do. You know, I know, I know you know what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6. And there he said to the church of God at Corinth, I have planted, you know it, Apollos water, but God gave the increase. God gives the increase. What we need to do is our part. Plant the water. Plant what? The seed of the kingdom. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Luke chapter 8 and verse 11. We need to plant and water the word of God. The seed of the kingdom. And God will always do his part. The problem with growth is not on God's part. It is on our part. God will always give the increase if we do our part. But our failure to do our part leads to him not failing, but him not giving the increase as we expect because we haven't done what he expects. God helps us with our part. He's given us his infallible, inerrant, and inspired word of God. He's provided us with the avenue of prayer and Paul, his providential oversight of our lives. We can't help God with his part, but we can do our part. What is... Uh, there's a line in an old Longfellow poem. Uh, and I, I'm, the, the title of the poem is, uh, has slipped my mind, forgive me, but there's one line, it's a long poem, maybe his longest poem. But Longfellow said, do thy duty, that is best. Leave unto thy Lord the rest. Do thy duty, that is best. Leave unto thy Lord the rest. The problem is, Hunter, we don't always do our duty. So we want to leave things to the Lord before we've done our part. I hear people say all the time, we just need to turn that over to God. That may be the case. I don't, I'm not trying to provide a rebuke to that. That may be the case. But maybe we need to back up, Barry, and ask, have we done our duty? Do thy duty. That is best. Leave unto thy Lord the rest. Brethren and friends, let's do our duty. What kind of church are we? Gospel church, going church, growing church. Point number four, my brethren and my friends. Not only are we all that, but we're a giving church. We're a giving church. In Acts chapter 2, really beginning with verse 42, we have, I, I would say, kind of a graphic, short, but graphic picture of the Jerusalem church, our first century brethren. And there is so much meat there. I have preached, I bet, a dozen different sermons, all from Acts 2, 42 through 47, the, maybe more than that. An entirely different sermons drawing on the riches of that section, Acts 2, 42 through 47, which is the final verse of chapter 2. Now, note 44 and 45. Again, I have it referenced on the screen before you. And all that believed were together. Are you there? Acts 2, 44 and 45. And all that believed were together and had all things common 
and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. That is a picture of benevolent giving. That is a picture of benevolent giving. That is a picture of brethren providing benevolent giving to other brethren. And all that believed were what together had all things common, sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men as every man had need. But they didn't give everything away because they still have things in Acts chapter 4 and the first part of Acts chapter 5. But they did what they needed to do at that time. How benevolent and how giving are we, brethren and friends? Now, I know that this is not the totality of our giving. This is one example of giving, benevolent giving, I call it. You, you choose your terminology in this particular example. that We've got 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Giving that we typically, and I think rightly, classifies giving as we're prospered on the first day of every week as an action of worship. And there Paul says, are you there? You know it. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints. As I have given order, and the word order there is from a Greek word that means a command, a directive. Unto the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of every week, let each one of you lay by him a store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. So there are different types or categories of giving that we can evolve ourselves in. We're certainly grateful for the one that is viewed here as an action of worship where we give as we're prospered every first day of the week. We're grateful for that. But I, I, I hope and I, and I believe that you do more than that. I know Shane and I do. And I believe with all my heart that you do. Our, our giving is not limited to that action of worship every first day of the week. That, that may be our main giving, but it's not our only giving. And so we uh, engage, uh, Shane and I do, in benevolent giving on top of that. And that might happen any time during the course of a week. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, nor necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 7. But also remember, brethren, also remember, but first they gave their own selves to the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 5. I know from your bulletin, uh, I know from my knowledge of this congregation, and I know from what Ronnie and I have talked and, and uh, conversations with your elder uh, eldership here, that really y'all have an excellent contribution for the size congregation you are. And we do. We, we do. Our, our contribution at Shades Mountain, and, and uh, Shane and I produce the bulletin, and uh, every week we post the contribution from the previous week uh, Sean, and then we have a year to date below that. And our treasurer, a young man, a, a faithful young man, uh, provides that data to me every Tuesday. Usually when I'm in ladies' Bible class, my phone will go off, and, and he's got it, then I put it on the board there. I teach our ladies' weekly ladies' Bible class, and, uh, and so that'll be on the board. I'll put it there, and it'll be there Wednesday night, and people can see what our numbers were Sunday, uh, both in attendance and in contribution. And uh, again, that's a wonderful thing. And so our contribution averages almost $3,000 a week. But we're a congregation that last year averaged 63 people on Sunday mornings. That's a pretty good contribution for that number of people. And we've always had a good contribution at Shades Mountain. And uh, so I'm saying here, beyond that first day of the week, let's be givers. What kind of church are we? Not just in the assembly. Let's think about this point number four again. What kind of church are we relative to our giving outside the assembly? What two or three things can you do for the church this week? And what two or three things can you do for someone else this week? What do you have that another is lacking? Maybe a co-worker or someone you go to school with or someone that your children or grandchildren play ball with or involved in some athletic uh, endeavor with. You may know of a need or have heard of a need that you might meet or help meet and do that. And you'll be rewarded for that. I have no doubt about it. It may be in the hereafter with stars in your crown, but we must be the kind of church that God would have us to be. Point number five tonight, brethren and friends, about uh, seven minutes before the hour of eight o'clock. What kind of church are we, brethren? Well, we're not only 
a gospel church and a going church and a growing church and a giving church, but we're a gathering church. We're a gathering church. Let's not begin there. We're going to come there. Let's begin at 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 18. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 18. For first of all, when you come together in the church, and you know that the Greek word for church is ekklesia, ekklesia. And depending upon the context, it may be best translated church or congregation or assembly. And here I would suggest to you that assembly is the best translation. What? For first of all, when you come together in the church, what? in the ecclesia, in the assembly, I hear that there be divisions among you and I partly believe it. We come together in the assembly. We're doing that tonight. Now, the context of 1 Corinthians 11 envisions a first day of the week assembly. And we already had that earlier this week on the first day of the week. And Lord willing, we'll have it again. Now drop down to verse 20. When you, can, when you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. When you come together, look at that language. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. There, there was a division among the brethren outside the assembly. And some of that had to do with, uh, with the, their uh, uh, socioeconomic uh, position That seems to be clear from the context. And that division was brought into the assembly, and that division corrupted the Lord's Supper. It corrupted the Lord's Supper because they were divided outside the assembly. They brought that into the assembly, and that is sadly the way it often works. We bring our troubles from outside the assembly into the assembly, and then trouble follows. Why are we surprised by that? But why are we letting it happen? Now, 1 Corinthians 14, 23. Chapter 14, 23. Just the first part of it. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place. And that is but three examples, 11, 18, 11, 20, and 14, 23, of I believe, uh, if, if I remember correctly, about seven times in 1 Corinthians that we have that type of language. Important language. We are a gospel church. We're a going church. We're a growing church. We're a giving church. We are a gathering church. We believe in gathering. Now, having said that, go with me to Hebrews chapter 10. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 10. And uh, we, we're, we're running out of time, but I'm going to pop over my Bible here. Uh, I don't want to, I can't get it all. Let, uh, uh, let's just begin with verse 24. And let us consider one another, just 24 and 25. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. Now stop right there. Don't even look at verse 25. Hold, hold your eyes off of it. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. Where are we going to do that? And when are we going to do that? Verse 25. Where and when? Answer to verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. When people who could assemble, choose not to assemble, then they cannot fulfill the demands of verse 24. They can't consider one another to provoke into love and good works. We need to be in the assembly. You know that. You're here tonight. I'm preaching the proverbial choir. We're a gathering church. That's why you were here on the Lord's Day. And you were here Monday night and Tuesday night and tonight. And I can't thank you enough for that, nor can Ryan. Thank you for being here, for being a gathering church. Now let me wrap up this point by quoting from a man who was not a member of the church. Ronnie uh, will recognize the name, the late A.T. Robertson. A.T. Robertson. Uh, Robertson, not a member of the Lord's church, prolific writer and a Greek scholar, a New Testament Greek scholar. He uh, wrote a six-volume uh, set of books called uh, word Pictures in the New Testament. I've had them for decades. They're wonderful. Word Pictures in the New Testament. In volume 5, which covers the Gospel of John and the book of Hebrews. I don't know why he combined them like that, but he's got John and Hebrews together. In volume 5, in the Hebrews section, chapter 10, verse 25, here's the comment that Robertson makes. Already, what? Already, and I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to cheat here. I want to make sure I get this exactly right. So let me, let me cheat here. I put a paper clip here. Where am I? There. All right. Already some Christians, already some Christians had formed the habit of not attending 
public worship. Watch it. We're not done. A perilous habit then and now. I'm going to quote that again. Robertson wrote that in the 1930s. The 1930s. I think around 1933. Already, this is a human comment about a verse, but actually I think he was right. Already some Christians had formed the habit of not attending public worship. Writing about Hebrews 10, 25. And then he concludes, a perilous habit then and now. He could not have been more right as a commentator on that particular verse of Scripture. Forsaking is from a Greek word that means literally to leave behind. To leave behind. Not forsaking. Not leaving behind. We, we can't afford to leave behind the assembling of ourselves together. Because when we come together, Paul, we can provoke. That's a beautiful word. That's a, that's a positive word. We can provoke one another unto love and good works. But if I choose not to be here, I can't get that from you and you can't get that from me. I mean, maybe there's another context where we can provide some of it outside the assembly, but according to this morning, that is actually taken care of and provided for in the assembly. And you know that already. We're a gathering church, indeed. Point number six, my brethren and my friends, I think I've got seven tonight. If I change my mind, we'll do eight, or we'll, 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 be, we'll be in that vicinity. All right, it is 801. Stay with me now. 801. Watch it now. Not only are we a gathering church, but we are a grateful church. We are a grateful church, indeed. Acts chapter 2, verse 47. I mentioned that verse earlier. Final verse of chapter 2. Praising God. Ooh. Praising God. Having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those being saved. That is gratefulness at its best. Praising God, having favor. The word, the Greek word for favor is the same Greek word or form of the same Greek word for, for grace. And having grace or favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those being saved. Indeed. I... Uh, Shane and I, let me qualify that. Shane and I raised our girls. We have three living daughters. Hallie, Hallie Lane Futural Poe, married to Cody Poe. They met at Freed Hardeman. And uh, uh, she might rebuke me if I, for telling this, but uh, they uh, had their, you know, started their freshman year together. The classes hadn't even started. Uh, I think they started in 2009 is when they were, uh, their freshman year at Freed Hardeman. And it was a couple of days before classes began, and they had been in a lecture, and then she happened to be in the same car with him and several other young people. And Hallie said, there was something said she didn't agree with, Ronnie. And she, my, my daughter's kind of like me, she just throws it out there, baby, and that, you know, that, that's just the way it is. And so she, she was in the car. She said, did anybody else have a problem with that like I did? And that's probably Anna knows our daughter, probably the way she said it, you know. <laughs> and uh, I think my son-in-law, who wasn't my son-in-law then, already had his eye on my girl. He said, I did. <laughs> I, I did. And so they've been together ever since then. And we couldn't ask for a better son-in-law than Cody Poe from Mount Vernon, Texas, baby. Mount Vernon, Texas. I didn't even know there was a Mount Vernon, Texas until I met that boy. And we love him like a son. Love him like a son. All of that, long way around the barn, admittedly. We raised our girls with a lot of different sayings. And one of them was this. We want gratitude, not attitude. We're your parents. One day you'll be parents. I want, we want, we expect gratitude, not attitude. Now, let's transplant that into the spiritual realm. A higher level, Ryan. We owe our God gratitude, not attitude. But Ronnie and I as Christians and as preachers have seen a lot of attitude. And, and attitude only goes so far. And then you just get tired of it. Let's have more among ourselves, more gratitude less attitude. And we'll be better because of it. And when we're better with one another, we'll be better with God. 
And so a grateful church can't go wrong. <coughs> point number seven, and finally, point number seven, and finally, my brethren and my friends, we are a glorious church. What kind of church are we? We better be a glorious church. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Watch it now. Are you there? Verse 27. That he might present it to himself a glorious church. Look at the language here. Not having spot or wrinkle nor any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Most of us, all of us, prefer our clothing, Brother Dan, to be without blemish, to be without spot. Uh, and uh, my wife did me a favor yesterday, with, uh, or a day or two ago, I took my, my jacket off after we got home from, from here, from the gospel meeting, I laid it on the bed, and our dog, uh, we got that little Jack Russell dog, and he jumped up on the bed, and uh, he uh, just decided to flop right down on this gray jacket right here. And, uh, you know, he's a beautiful little creature, but I had to get him off my coat, baby. Got those little white hairs everywhere. And so I was looking at it, and I got it out of the truck tonight. Uh, and Shane had already used whatever that thing is. You ladies know whatever it is. I, uh, forgive me, you know, you peel the thing off and then roll it all over the thing. And uh, so, uh, well, that sounds pitiful, isn't it? I can't even think of that. But uh, she... Uh, Mop this baby down and got that dog off this. I don't want to get up here and stand up here and you. But what kind of jacket's Brother Mel got on? Is that a dog hair jacket? Oh, of course not. We don't want that. You're being silly, Brother Mel. I'm being silly to make a point. To make a point. We normally, Hunter, want our clothes to be blemish free, spot free, holy and without blemish. Well, what about our lives? What about us as a church? Do we expect more of our clothing when, than we do of our, ourselves? Well, I'm afraid at times we do. That we want to look right even if we're not right. That can't be right. Just can't be right. So this is our final point. And this is the point we're going to end on. And this is the point that I want to leave you with as the closing point tonight. We want to be all of that and more. There's more that could be said, but our time has passed up. Let us conclude our thinking tonight. I'm preaching the word. You're hearing the word. This is an acceptable act of worship to God by determining that we'll leave here to be a glorious church. God will be proud of us. We'll be grateful to him for all that he's done for us. I can never repay my Savior. I cannot repay my Savior. But I can do my duty that is best. And then I'll leave unto my Lord the rest. Let's be all we can be while we have time to be that. And then one day we'll, as the old preachers used to say, we'll go home to glory. We'll go home to glory. I believe that. We'll go home to glory. Life is short. Death is sure. Eternity is forever. Who we are as the church of Christ matters. Who we need to be and better be matters. So please think about that in the most positive way possible. Grounding it as we've done tonight in the word of God. Let us determine to go forward and be the people, the church that God would have us to be. The honor has been mine. The only way you could honor me more is if you have a need that Ronnie and I might meet tonight. As a child of God, do you need prayer? Do you need prayer? There's almost always someone who needs the public prayers of the church. And, I, and I'm not trying to bait anyone to come forward. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not that kind of a preacher. Uh, I, I, in fact, I'm, I'm, I have a little suspicion about preachers who preach only to that end. But if at all, brother, sister, if you have a need, as a child of God, as a brother, as a sister in Christ, that we can help you meet via prayer, beginning with prayer, and maybe it will extend beyond that, then we want to help you with that. If we didn't believe in prayer, we wouldn't do it. But we do believe, and we do do it. 
And if we can help you become a child of God tonight, I can't think of a better time to do that. On Sunday, a couple of the young people here who are a little bit older now uh, reminded me that they had obeyed the gospel when I was here for the first gospel meeting. And I have to honestly say I had forgotten about that. And I'm not going to call their names, but thank you for reminding me of that. And I was so honored then to be before you and preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. Do what you need to do to become a child of God or be a faithful child of God and do it right now as together we stand and sing. application to your life, you'll do just exactly that. I want to emphasize one thing. This is for the members here at Adamfield. There are a stack of these cards out here on this table. I, I need two or three deacons out in the foyer to grab a handful of cards, give every member of church here a card as they go out the door. They may litter the parking lots with them. But uh, this is that one for Christ. And all it's got is little check, uh, little boxes on it. And all you have to do to fill that little box is say, what's your name? Ashley Kaiser. Where you go to church, Ashley? We'd like to invite you to Adamfield Church of Christ. Boom, that's it. It's not a scorecard. It's not a, a, a race. I, I, even though Gary and I kid each other all the time. He said, I think he said five or six invitations. He said, all right, I said, I beat you. I've already got eight. I've got eight marks on my card already. We're shooting for 200 a month. Why? Because we love lost souls. Because we love lost souls. It's easy. Get one of the pamphlets outside that says, Asheville Church of Christ. Just hand it to them. You don't even have to ask their name. Just hand them a packet, mark the card. Because we love lost souls. Uh, the elders thought that this is a great time. Between the gospel meeting and next month, the end of the month, will be our vacation Bible school. Uh, this is a good time for us to get back to thinking about lost souls. I agree with them teetotally, and I'm supporting them a thousand percent. I'm going to be gone. <laughs> with all that said, I'm in a gospel meeting starting Sunday. It goes through Friday up in uh, Spring Valley, which is up near Tuscumbia, Alabama. Uh, so y'all going to get a whole week a head start on me in regards to inviting individuals. 
Pick a card up, please. That all this is is a reminder. I don't want it to be a guilt trip. The eldership don't want it to be a guilt trip. If you invite one person, I'm going to smile just like my new little grandbaby smiles when you talk to him sometimes, just wide open. Because I think God will be proud of you for working in his kingdom. And isn't that what we're about? Ryan has a youth announcement. Then you can call somebody later in prayer. Thank you for coming. Indebted to so many of you for all of the wonderful things that have taken place this week. Meals. I know my blood sugar is way well on up there and I will be eating lettuce for the rest of the week. But there you go. And uh, it, 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 everything's just been beautiful this week. Thank you. I want to echo all of those sentiments. Thank you so much for being here. Those of you who have attended all week, Brother Mel, truly have enjoyed it. Only regret that I could not be at all the morning services. I know some of you were able to do that, and I know that that was very uplifting, and I know that he did a great job with those as well. Just a couple of youth announcements. I've already mentioned them uh, a lot this week. I'm going to add one tonight, though. Uh, first, don't forget about our game night for the 6th through 12th grade. Those of you who just graduated, we're not kicking you out. You guys are welcome to come, too. We're not, going to, we're not going to kick you out and give you the boot and, and send you out to the wolves. You're going to be just fine to come hang out with us all through the summer until you transition to whatever role you're going to, you're going to do here in this church. Uh, you're welcome to come hang out with the youth group still. Uh, I always tell them that Ashley put up with me for four plus years. So after I graduated, bless his heart. So don't forget about the game night on the 10th. That's this Friday at 7 o'clock. Eat dinner before you get here. I'll make sure that there are snacks and drinks and things like that. I've been going around taking everybody's drink orders. So we should be, that refrigerator downstairs should be good and full. And then what I wanted to do is, I know we've, we've got the Devo at the end of the month on the 26th. We'll I'll harp on that more later in the month or in, in the next couple of weeks. Ronnie gave me the perfect segue into this. Vacation Bible School is coming up fast. All right, you guys don't realize it, but it is, it is moving quick. And the last full week in July is our Vacation Bible School. And as you guys know, that takes a lot of effort and planning on behalf of everybody. So what I would like to do on Sunday evening after our worship service, this Sunday evening after our worship service, I would like to have a vacation Bible school meeting. And this is going to be the, this is going to be kind of that big grand, you know, intro meeting where we, we talk about teachers and we talk about what the topic is and things like that. And you guys can start helping me plan how we're going to decorate the hallway, how we're going to decorate the auditorium. Any ideas you got? Ronnie's stepping out here. I can see that he's got something else. Hey, Shane has already beat it. She's already got three invitations for vacation Bible school. Y'all gonna have to get to work. <laughs> Invite people to BBS. Uh, but but let's meet on Sunday night and make sure that we have a good BBS for them to come to. Uh, if you participated in in last year in, in some manner and you would like to, to continue to serve in that manner and help in that manner, come to that meeting, let me know. I think I've got the list from last year. And if, if you did something last year that you don't want to do again, that's, that's too bad. There's no takesies backsies. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. We can find somebody to fill in if that's what we need to do. So plan on that Sunday night after church. Are there any other announcements that need to be made from the pulpit this evening? Thank you so much for being here this week. At this time, Asa, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you to come up here and lead us in a dismissal prayer. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this night that you've given us to come out and worship you. We thank you for the gospel meeting that we've had and for Brother Mel Futrell and the work that he's done and the lessons that he's taught us. We pray that we'll apply them to our lives. Please help us as we try to invite people to Vacation Bible School Help us to be effective and diligent. Help us to be like Christ. We're also mindful of those who are sick and those who are sad, who have lost loved ones. We pray for them. Please help us to continue to do what is right. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.